This is Law Bites, a podcast with Michael Geist. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and it is truly an honour to be here tonight to rise in this House to talk about such an important bill, Bill S-210, Protecting Young Persons from Exposure to Pornography Act. This act is to restrict young persons' online access to sexually explicit material. Welcome back to the Law Bites podcast. This is the first episode of 2024, and I start with an issue that is likely to attract significant legislative attention in the coming year. I've described Bill S-210, the Protecting Young Persons from Exposure to Pornography Act, as the most dangerous internet bill you've never heard of, as it contemplates measures that raise privacy concerns, website blocking, and extend far beyond pornography sites to include search and social media. The bill started in the Senate and, having passed there, is now in the House of Commons, where MPs late last year voted in favour of it at second reading and sent it to committee for further study. While the government has called it fundamentally flawed, support from opposition parties and some Liberal MPs could result in it becoming law. Bill S-210 is the brainchild of Senator Julie meville de Chêne, a former Radio Canada broadcaster who was appointed to the Senate by Justin Trudeau in 2018. The senator graciously agreed to join me on the podcast to debate her bill as she provided her rationale for it and defended against the criticism and concerns it has sparked. Senator, thanks so much for joining me on the podcast. Well, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, no, I'm really glad that that you've taken the time to come on. We, you know, we've obviously disagreed on the substance of Bill S210, and I'm really grateful to you for taking the time to come on the podcast and discuss. I've got a whole series of questions, some concerns about the bill, and those have been talked about on my blog and in the media a bit. But I really wanted to start first by giving you the chance to make the case for the legislation. You know, I think we know, but what what's the problem that you're trying to solve? And even more importantly, I think, why do you think Bill S-210 is the right approach to try to solve it? Well, I think, uh, Mr. Geist, it's more than a problem. I think what we're seeing is a critical public health issue uh, because since the arrival of free porn sites, children have unlimited access and they watch millions of hardcore porn videos. And those videos are often violent, uh, where women are almost always submissive or in position of inferiority. So I can testify to it because I've watched those porn sites to defend my bill as 210. As you well know, in the real world, we have decided as a society that children cannot have access to X movies, sex shops, porn magazine, but on the internet, there's no barrier, nothing. So why is that? There's no logic. So I'll give you just a few figures. Um, on average, uh, the age of contact with porn is between 11 or 13, depending on studies. And at 13 years old in UK, for example, 27% of kids have seen porn. So for three years, I've talked to multiple health experts, pediatricians, sex therapists, read all the studies, um, and, and the consensus is clear. No child should have access and should watch pornography. Um, so I found the best studies, I have to say. They come from the UK Child Commissioner. Kids' access to violent pornography might influence harmful sexual behavior in the future. It fuels violence against women and girls. And listen to that. This is a survey that did strike me. Uh, 16 to 21 years old survey, and they reveal that almost half respondents expect sex to involve physical aggression. Growing research draws worrisome links between uh, porn and, and uh, harmful um, behaviors. So we need to act before generations of children are convinced that porn performance is reality and has to be replicated in sex life. So that's why I call it uh, a health uh, issue, a very serious health issue. Some others, uh, you probably know that a week ago, the Spain prime minister called it an epidemic. And you know, I'm not the only one to think that. This is not a personal crusade. You probably know that there's such a consensus that European Union, Germany, France, United Kingdom, and eight US states 
have or will soon pass law to verify age and limit access to porn. So you've said it at the beginning, Mr. Geist, that we disagree on some issue, but I hope we do agree with the fact that children should not watch porn. Sure. I, I, I think we, I think we can't, we can agree on that. Um, you know, I, I want to ask you some specific questions about the bill, but, but before absolutely. I get that, we can absolutely agree on this. Why is okay. Bill S210 the right way to deal with this though? Okay. So since we agree on, on the problem, and 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 the way that you know the the fact that we should try to find a solution, uh, um, my bill. So I've been working for three years on this bill. It has passed uh, without opposition in the Senate, and now it's in the House of Commons. So I've worked hard on on writing this bill and on adding amendments. Uh, the bill is is has two track. Uh, there's the criminal law track. Uh, we add a criminal offense uh, saying that organization that distributes um, uh, sexually explicit material to kids uh, are committing an offense. So this is the, the criminal track. Um, obviously, if they have age verification, uh, you know, they are respecting the law. But I have another track, which is administrative which is um, if it is found that a web a porn site or an organization is distributing sexually explicit material to kids, well, um, they will be asked to stop. And if they don't stop in a number of days, um, court action will be taken at the federal court. And uh, if the proof is, is, um, is, uh, is there, well, um, the website, the porn site, which is not respecting the law, could be blocked. So um, that's in a nutshell this um, um, this this uh, <laughs> this bill. But you can ask me further question. And we have made sure in its last um, uh, uh, passage that it contains a criteria to respect privacy. And those criteria are very explicit. They come from an expert in privacy, whose name is Keith Jensa, who said that if those criteria are used to choose um, to choose a way to do age verification, it's going to be okay for privacy. Okay. Well, that that's th thanks for both outlining the bill and and touching on why you think it's the right approach. I I do have quite a number of questions. And, and I guess I, I would start with, with this. You know, we can certainly agree that underage access to sexually explicit material raises concerns, and you've highlighted uh, some statistics and, and evidence as to why that's the case. But why don't you think filtering tools that parents could install in their home computer networks or on kids' devices are inadequate? And, and I should preface it by no, noting that I know that the FAQ that you've posted, and for listeners, you've posted a detailed uh, FAQ that, yes. that that seeks to defend the bill, and I'll put a, a link to that in the show notes. But, you know, I know that your FAQ says that 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 uh, filters have limited effectiveness, but the same FAQ acknowledges that with virtual private networks, with VPNs, the proposed law also has limited effectiveness. So, you know, why isn't filtering, uh, even if it is imperfect, a better approach as the law itself is imperfect given some of these technologies? Well, because if the goal is to have children uh, be blocked and not watch porn, um, you will agree with me that VPNs are used mostly by um, older kids, teenagers who know how to um, uh, put them up. And um, research also show that younger kids, um, 11, under 11, under 13, do not use VPNs. We know VPNs can, can, can uh, prevent uh, the porn site, for example, know, to know where you are. So I understand what you're saying. But at the same time, no law is perfect. And it's not because um, the law preventing kids to buy alcohol or drugs is, is, is unperfect because as you know, kids drink alcohol and smoke pot that we won't have a law. 
I find this particular logic difficult to understand. No law is perfect, Mr. Geist. So in this case, it's the best way to try to have a maximum children be protected. And also, you know, the idea that there's a message here, not only you say, are you 18 and you can enter whatever, but there's a message saying, you know, you have to go through age verification and what would happen you know, nothing is, is said in the bill about that. But the best practice suggests that automatically the kids who want to access those porn sites would be really directed to a third party verifier. And there, you know, the signal is pretty clear that this is not for you. That's true. But you haven't really answered my question. Why aren't filters a better approach? Parents oh. who want to parents who want to ensure that their kids don't see this content, can install filters, we can create, uh, we can, I'm sure, get the internet providers and others on board to ensure that these are available, that people understand how to install them. If this is, at the end of the day, a desire to ensure by parents that, you know, they want, let's say, uh, they're, they want to ensure that the, the kids, if the kids are, let's say, 11 or 12, not to have access, but if their kids are 16 or 17, perhaps they are more comfortable with it. Why not allow parents to make that choice with with filtering technology, which can be an effective tool in ensuring that those choices are respectively respected? Well, first of all, you said it yourself. It's not an effective tool. Um, there's little empir empirical evidence uh, that it's an effective means to limit children and adolescent you know, exposure to porn. No studies have shown that. And why is that? You know, frankly, uh, to presume that all parents have uh, the expertise to install those filters uh, is a bit of a dream, uh, Mr. Geist. Uh, we have talked about that uh, publicly in, in, um, in committee. You may have the expertise to do it. Many others don't. And they are overwhelmed by what their kids are going through it can be on their phone. It can be on the phone of, of a friend. Um, you know, the control is not as easy as you say, and no study say that those filters are efficient. Uh, and we're seeing growing numbers of kids watching porn. So it means parents either don't know what to do, are overwhelmed, um, have uh, limited um, uh, expertise in internet. So this is why, you know, it has to be taken at, at the state level. Would you say the same thing, um, Mr. Guys, for um, alcohol or cigarettes, that parents should be the only one responsible for their kids not accessing tobacco? I do say parents, let's say in the case of alcohol, for example, there are plenty of parents that uh, are comfortable with their kids, uh, even though they might be 19 or whatever the age happens to be, uh, 18 if they're in Quebec, having some wine with dinner. It's not uncommon for parents to make some of those kinds know. of uh, but, some of those kinds of choices. And so this is to me fundamentally. But, but, but they know but they, they know that choices. they're 18. They know that they're 13, uh, 15, 16 at the store won't be able to buy three packs of, of gin, uh, three bottles of gin. So this is exactly the same thing. Why would we have parents responsible by themselves for such difficult controls? You know, as in the real life, it's not the case. You know, you are putting too much responsibility, I find, on parents. And to be frank, parents in polls in the UK are saying they want age verification. So we are not talking about to the same people. I'm talking here in my community, to young people, to parents, and to be frank, uh, they are for age verification and for my bill. Well, I think there, there may be some who are for addressing the issue, whether they're for the bill in light of the costs that the bill brings, because I think oftentimes the costs that are embedded in this bill aren't well understood. And let, let me turn to some of, of those issues. Sure. Uh, I'll start with the, the age verification technology. You know, you like to talk about a lot of the other governments that have established this, but Australia is actually the government that we seem to follow very 
often when it comes to some of these issues. And just in the last six months, it concluded, the Australian government, that age assurance technologies are immature and present privacy, security, implementation and enforcement risks. Why do you think the Australian government has this wrong? Well, this is the only government, and that's why you're pointing it out, that has decided not to go forward with age verification. I would say at this point, the majority of government, and we, you know, many times follow the United Kingdom example, they have moved to online safety bill, which is so uh, wide in terms of protecting children, not only uh, porn uh, sites, but in general on all the social media against prejudices. So it's, it's a strong bill. It took time to build. No, I, I, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. I appreciate that there are some governments that have established this yes, and others that many. happen. The question was about the privacy related concerns. You cited one person that you said gives you this assurance. We have had others that clearly have studied this issue that have raised significant concerns about the kind of data that gets co collected. In fact, this is being provided to foreign based providers, which increases cross border data disclosures in many circumstances. Uh, the, the privacy issues, I don't think can simply be said, well, other governments made a choice. No, no, no. I understand. It. So let me answer to that. Um, first, this bill in particular has not chosen any mechanism for age verification. This bill on the question is agnostic because those questions have to be solved in regulations. That's the way it works. You know it very well. So this bill doesn't enter this because as you know, technology evolves. It gets all the time better. So we have to leave that to regulation. And the government at that point has every power to decide which kind of age verification, which mechanism is the best one, because there are hundreds of them. But I would say, you know, obviously not, no methods, it's absolutely zero risk, but we can choose the best system, which will leave less trace. Um, I will repeat to you that, you know, we can erase uh, the data, uh, we can make sure it's a mechanism that, that doesn't go too far. Um, but frankly, this is not in the bill. This is to be discussed afterwards. So how can you say that this bill is dangerous since it doesn't contain any mechanism that you could uh, dissect and say, this is wrong and this is good. We have decided, and I think it was the right decision because that's the way it's done in legislation, to leave that to regulations. And that's exactly what the countries, the other countries are doing. It's not that they don't find it an important point. Privacy is important, but it will be discussed between experts at the regulation level. And neither you and me, you know, you are a lawyer, I'm a former journalist, we're not experts in privacy issue. We know it can be dangerous, but this bill, in itself cannot be qualified dangerous because the mechanism is not in it. In some ways, uh, respectfully, it seems to me that makes it even more dangerous. Uh, I, I have served on the Privacy Commissioner's Advisory Board. I do know something about privacy. And I also know something about the experience we've recently seen where it's essentially a trust us, let's leave it to regulation style approach. We've seen it with C11 and C18. And so this notion that there's nothing to worry about because we'll figure out the technology later, you know, it, it's not entirely clear to me. Well, it is clear to me. I don't know why anybody would trust that in light of both the the, the clear, there are clearly risks. I mean, you're essentially acknowledging that there are risks with no, these kinds I'm, of technology. Well, we have I'm, other governments that have rejected this entire approach specifically because of those issues. One, one of the one that we've tried to model many of our laws on, including C-18 and online harms. And so that there are clearly real issues and the, there may be other governments that simply haven't moved forward in light of some of those kinds of concerns. So there is an issue there. Is, is trust us really good enough when it comes to this issue? Well, you know, uh, at this point, you know, is, is it really privacy uh, that is your great concern with the bill? Or is it just the fact that you don't want regulation because you say 
parents can do it perfectly well themselves. But in the case of privacy, I would say that we have privacy laws that exist. I'm not saying they're perfect, but we, we have them. For example, when you want to gamble, when you go on a site and you want to gamble, you need to show ID. Have you ever uh, done a blog on this? You know, is it a problem for you that gambling should be for, for adults only and they show probably a credit card or other things to be uh, admitted in the gambling, gambling sites? Is it such a scandal for you? I don't think so. It cannot be, you know, gambling is for adults. So why would it be that different from <laughs> porn? Because in that case, all precautions would be taken to protect and to destroy data. Um, you know, there would be accreditation. We would not leave, I think, you know, this is not my call, but the porn sites are obviously not the one who have to, to um, verify age because they're porn sites. Uh, so I think, you know, I'm not saying those are not important issue. I'm just saying, saying we can't trust anything and that let's, let's, not, let's not think the bill has some qualities because we don't know everything about age verification is a bit of a, you know, it's the case for every legislation. Most. Well, it's not. I, I, I'm not sure that it's the case for every legislation. For, for it's many not, it's, it, it's not. It's not every bill that that essentially acknowledges that there are real privacy risks and seeks to try to circumscribe it a little bit by saying, "Hey, at least consider these things down the road." I think Five those are criteria. real risks. As I say, we have seen other other governments, or at least the Australian government, reject it. But why don't we? Why don't we? We'll, we're yes, well, agree I, I on will privacy. give you an example. You Let, know, let's well. just let's move on to let's okay, move on to another. C eighteen. Yeah. Is, is, is a perfect case of regulations coming to change quite a bit. Yes. Uh, what we had, so, so to, to, to think that the law in itself is the only thing that we can look at, I, I, I don't think it's a valid point. Anyway, well, C18 let's, let's is continue. A, yeah, C18 to me is exactly the, pre presents the exact opposite conclusion, that in fact, if regulations can essentially upend and completely overhaul the legislation, these kind of very light safeguards, so-called, in that saying, well, we'd like to see the regulations do this or that, aren't safeguards at all. Because what we've seen with C-18 is it's entirely possible that when push comes to shove, government does whatever it wants. And if that potentially means that even those safeguards are gone, then they're gone. But as I say, well, let's, contrary better, to let's... you, I believe, you know, in some good faith, I believe it's an important issue i believe kids have to be protected and i don't see why we would adopt a system that would be um dangerous for privacy yeah, well I, I listen we as i say we can agree that it's that it is a an issue to address but i as i say i think it's pretty clear this bill itself raises some significant concerns another of one of which that i want to turn to because it's not just about privacy there's at least two others that i think need to be discussed mm -hmm. uh, no i've heard heard you say that your intent is to cover pornography sites like MindGeek, but the, the bill as drafted covers a far wider range of sites, including social media and search. In fact, the age verification lobby, because there is a lobby group out there that pushes for this kind of legislation in other countries to try to essentially sell their technology, explicitly says it should cover social media. Now, there are other jurisdictions, for example, Montana, that have provided definitions that limit the application to sites where a substantial portion of the content is sexually explicit. If your goal is to target pornography sites, you know, why not target those sites and remove the risk of having this law apply to general social media or search? Well, I, I mostly talk about porn sites because I find it um, easy to understand. They're a hundred percent, uh, transmitting porn and it's their whole business is around porn but as you well know there is porn elsewhere and uh, the bill as drafted uh, talk about content um, you know talk about organization that distribute content so obviously let's take an example if a website tomorrow morning just comes up with video games for kids and they just add 20% of porn. 
on that particular website. Do you find it's okay? Do you find it's something that should be looked at, you know, in terms of uh, age verification? We have a website attracting kids, you know, in particular, and they have porn there. So obviously, you know, at the stage of the legislation, the idea is that if an organization um, distributes porn, and we're talking here about sexually explicit material as defined in the criminal code, which is explicit, graphic, uh, and, and, you know, not nudity. Uh, we are looking for arousal, arousal, sexual arousal there. So it's, it's, it's pretty graphic. So if, if a website um, puts up uh, 20% or, or 30% of pornography, well, the method is already there. Look at Twitter. The porn on Twitter, when you, when you, when you look at, you know, there are some, some, some porn sites, you, it's blocked. There's already a, a blog saying, you know, do you really want to access this particular material? So it could go a step further and, you know, be controlled in terms of age verification. So it's doable, but I'm not saying this is what's going to be done. I'm saying first, uh, this is obviously not limited to porn site. How wide should we go? I think uh, the House of Commons will have a committee to discuss those questions. As you know, um, I think in one of the first uh, texts in uh, the UK United Kingdom, they were talking about a 33% threshold of pornography. So this can be done. Um, there can be changes in the committee and, and Mr. Geist, there can be changes or they can be some, some specification once more in the regulations. But really, what is different between a website that has 20%, 30% of, of porn and is accessible to children uh, with another website, which has 100% of porn? Well, if, think... if the goal is to prevent children to access porn. Well, I mean, I think I'm hearing you say that that Twitter should require age verification. That Google should require no, no, no. age. That only... should require age verification. Your 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 bill no. says no. Any only... organization that makes available sexually explicit yes. material that includes those sites. Those but sites it... make that content available. And if you're saying that the percentage doesn't really matter, and you are at a minimum, you didn't include a percentage here. You left it open that it it would even apply there. And you just said that well, if Twitter can could make the image hide the image that you have to click on it why can't they actually require everyone who uses twitter to age verify no 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 that's not what i'm saying i'm not saying all twitter mr geist i'm saying the particular content that is porn should be verified it's not a question of verifying the age of people going on social media i've never said that i've said that in some social media there is porn and it's this particular porn that has to have some you know that could have some some age verification to go on not the rest of twitter not 95 percent of twitter i'm not saying that but this content is often embedded within general general not, results frankly some of some of not the posts really. i've done on this bill oftentimes involves this content are, are you know is it is google if they supposed to ensure that the search results don't include content if the person hasn't been age verified? Mm -mm. So here, you know, Google. Google testified to our committee. Uh, first of all, you know, Google is, is, is not an host and of, of no, but of they make, content. but they make, Absolutely. they make sexually Absolutely. explicit material avail on the internet available, Absolutely. which is falls within you, your definition. Okay. Have you heard uh, Mr. McKay on our committee? What he said basically, and he did not disagree with an age verification uh, law. What he said is, as soon as there's an age verification law, 
And if it's not followed, we at Google will use our tool, and our tool is reference, to put this, this, this unlawful site further down and to dereference it. So that's what Google would do. I'm not, you know, I'm not into a censorship cr crusade as, 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 you know, some have said. I'm just trying to protect children. So the idea is on porn content, yes, there should be something. It's already something that it's blocked. And then, you know, uh, it's asked, do you really want to see this picture? But basically, it's not enough. Uh, and, and, you know, this is the way I see it, uh, Mr. Geist. But now it's in the end of the MPs. They have a committee. They will hear you. They will hear other experts who think differently. Uh, I'm thinking of Pierre Trudel, who came to our committee uh, twice, if I remember well, and who said very clearly that this is a law that only tries to replicate what's happening in the real world. And, and you know, the fact yeah, no, that... No, no, I, and I realize, listen, I realize there are supporters of the legislation, and I did oh, follow... Oh, they are. There are I, did, I did follow Professor Trudel's comments. I'm sure he'll have the chance to speak to... Yes committee uh the the point isn't that committee can change the bill the point is that this was the bill you put forward and has shepherded through and so that's why i'm asking you specifically well, about well, it yes, and there is it, and there is and there is one more element that i, I don't yes. want to make sure we have time to to discuss Please. and and that and you talk about that this is not a censorship bill you know your website uh, we mentioned it as i say it'll be in the link to the show notes says that bill s210 will have no impact on no any impact. Adult's ability to access por pornographic content online and but, I maintain that. Okay. But the bill itself provides for website blocking of non-compliant sites and section 9.5 states specifically that if a court determines that an order is needed, it may have the effect of preventing access to material other than sexual explicit material made available by the organization. Now, isn't that uh, frankly an express admission that adults face the possibility of blocked access to lawful content. I mean, basically, your bill no. literally says no. that an order can result in blocked lawful content. It's not clear no. to me how you can say that there's no impact on people's ability to access content. So, uh, Mr. Geist, um, this is not what it means. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, on Pornhub, for example, they have a page of two which is qualified sexual education advices when you look at porn. So it means that on such a website, if it's blocked, those pages would disappear. It's not, it's not a, it, it, you know, a website that carry a hundred percent porn. If they're blocked, it would be porn that would be blocked. So, you know, in this case, the porn site would not uh, follow the law. If somebody is in violation of the law, there must be some consequence. And you well know that uh, we cannot apply the criminal code from, for international uh, companies that are outside Canada. So that's why the idea is the ultimate, the ultimate um, act that can be the punishment would be blocking this website. But you know, if by any chance there's one page on this porn website that is about some other thing, yes, it would be blocked. So that's why there's this little um, add-on that we did after consulting experts. But, you know, Bell Canada, who, who Bell, not Bell, who, who did testify, no, not testify. They sent, um, uh, they sent a document. They sent a document saying it can be well done without overreach, blocking only one website. And they were very powerful on that. If, if, if Bell says it can be done, well, you know, with an injunction or with a court order, why doubt that? Well, you, you might doubt it because Bell's been actively pursuing site blocking on copyright grounds. And that, in fact, the experience over many years on site blocking is that it very often does involve over blocking. But we don't even have to get into the issue of over blocking. Your site says adults 
will that there will be no impact on any adult's ability to access pornographic content no. online. You are also now telling me that if a foreign site doesn't abide by your law, adults will not have be able to have access to that content. Is that I, I mean, I just don't understand how that can be interpreted in any other way <laughs> of saying you're blocking what is lawful content. Well, no, if 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 the if the, the webs, if the site doesn't follow the law, violates the law, well, it's a different game altogether. What I'm saying is that uh, adults will have no problem uh, accessing websites that are respecting the laws of the land. And well, that's I'm, not, I'm sure but, but you that, would. But that's I'm not sure what that. Would... That's not what that says. <laughs> you, yes. you are. It doesn't say laws that. Laws are laws. You know, if if the content, website... the, the whether or not a site uses age verification doesn't change whether or not the content itself is lawful content and whether or not adults have access to that lawful content. And by your own admission, you will require blocking of that content. How I just don't see how you can say that that doesn't affect people's ability to access that lawful content. Well, we disagree on that uh, respectfully, uh, Mr. Geist. I think it's perfectly clear, clear that adults will continue to have access to multiple uh, porn sites if they do accept age verification. The idea that um, <laughs> that organization that do not follow the law will be blocked is something else altogether. Um, and, and the idea here is to have those websites follow the law. I think it's very clear, but I'm not worrying on, I'm not worrying adults will continue to be able to watch porn. I think here, let's recenter the debate on what we're trying to do. And what we're trying to do is protect kids that are now seeing porn as the norm that are now seeing performance as the way they have to go with their own sexuality. You know, you've read, I'm sure, as much as me on the topic. So this is a harm to, to, to a whole generation. And I think, yes, uh, adults will continue to watch porn. I don't think this is a danger. Yeah, no, I get. I, I I don't think that. I th listen. I, the danger here, as I think, as, as I've tried to highlight, is is not that issue. The danger here is blocking lawful content, which is by your own admission, this will happen. It is the privacy well, issue it will happen that governments if they don't have obey raised, the law. and it's and it's including this in general purpose sites like search and social media by design, in effect, and saying, well, maybe the committee itself might choose, or the regulations might choose to limit it. You know. But listen, well, obviously, obviously, we've got different every, views on this. Let, yes. let me let me conclude with this. Yes. Uh, you know, the, the government has come out against the bill. Yes. Um, you know, what are what are your thoughts on the the government's opposition to this? And to the extent to which, so, you know, they see it as fundamental, they've described it as fundamentally flawed. Uh, your your thoughts on, on government's opposition, because surely this government, which has been very aggressive when it comes to internet regulation, um, you know, is is not averse to regulating, but yet they see this bill as fundamentally flawed. Well, um, it came to be frank as a bit of a surprise because I didn't have those signals. Um, uh, you remember, um, you know, I tried to put uh, an amendment in C11 on that particular issue. And, um, I thought, you know, there was an openness here to tackle the issue. So, so, you know, they are bringing up the same arguments as you do. They're adding freedom of expression, which is, you know, I'm sorry, but, but, but porn actors cannot, you know, the freedom of expression of porn actors cannot be more important than the protection of children. Um, so I don't get it. I don't get this argument. Uh, I'm a journalist. I'm very attached to freedom of expression. I don't think this bill in any way threatens um, freedom of expression. The government has um, published a three lines statement. There's been no uh, added uh, arguments around it. Um, you know, you have some. But I have not heard the government on 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 the on the content. 
So I'm a bit puzzled uh, by that. To be frank, I'm not that attached to, you know, <laughs> single lines of my bill. If the government wants to tackle this issue in its online harm bills, as the United Kingdom did, well, it's great, but I haven't had the signal. Um, so maybe you have, but it seems that they don't, they don't want to touch uh, pornography. So I, I'm wondering why, to be frank, because there's more and more study saying how this is detrimental for our children. Um, so, um, so I think, you know, the best way to go is to have this, uh, a committee in the House of Commons, uh, who will study it, uh, thoroughly, who can obviously propose, uh, amendments that will make it better. That's the whole process, Mr. Geist. And I believe in that process and then we'll see. But as you know, you know, I have the unanimous support of all the opposition party on this bill. We'll see how things developed. Yes. And I guess we'll see how that how that whether or not that opposition part, those opposition parties remain, uh, remain, remain in their in their views. But uh, certainly this this, I think, will be one of the defining digital policy issues in the coming year. And so I wanted to start my new episodes of the podcast off this year, focusing on it. And uh, I'm grateful for you coming on and offering yes. up a, a very <laughs> stirring, uh, passionate defense of uh, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. You know, I believe in debate. Um, this is not, you know, black and white, but there are some some principles, obviously, that I'm very strong on. Thank you. That's the Law Bites podcast for this week. If you have comments, suggestions or other feedback, write to Law Bites at PO Follow the podcast on Twitter at Law Bites Pod or Michael Geist at M Geist. You can download the latest episodes from my website at michaelgeist.ca or subscribe via RSS at Apple Podcast, Google, or Spotify. The Law Bites podcast is produced by Gerardo LeBron LeBoy. Music by the LeBoy brothers, Gerardo and Jose LeBron LeBoy. Credit information for the clips featured in this podcast can be found in the show notes for this episode at michaelgeist.ca. I'm Michael Geist. Thanks for listening and see you next time.